morning, uh, folks online. Good to have you joining us this morning here at the Stockton Methodist Church where we gather to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Beloved, I want to invite you to please stand as you are able and lift your voices this morning to the God who loves us. Please be seated. Would you join me in the call to worship the Apostles' Creed? 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we are so fortunate to have this church and the freedom to worship you. We thank you for this wonderful blessing. We ask that your Holy Spirit fill our hearts and minds as we hear this modern rendition of the 23rd Psalm, which can also provide us with a prayerful confession of faith to begin this day. The Lord is my strength. I shall not panic. He helps me relax and rest in quiet trust. He reminds me that I belong to him and restores my serenity. He leads me in my decisions and gives me calmness of mind. His presence is peace. Even though I walk through the valley of the fear of failure, I will not worry for he will be with me. His truth, grace, and loving kindness will stabilize me. He prepares release and renewal in the midst of my stress. He anoints my mind with wisdom. My cup overflows with fresh energy. Surely goodness and mercy will be communicated through me, for I shall walk in the strength of my Lord and dwell in his presence forever. Amen. Thank you, Sister Rita. Amen. Amen to what you said. Well, beloved, this is a special day here at the church. It's one of the great days uh, when uh, we gather together as a church and people hear and respond to the call that God puts on their heart to become part of the family of Christ. And so uh, I want to take a moment to invite Brad and Diane Myers to come on forward and join me up here this morning. It's a day I've been looking forward to, I have to say. Good to have you guys here. Absolutely. Glory to God. Glory to God. What I want you to do is kind of turn around and face the rest of your family here. And I'm by your family, I'm saying everybody here. So. <laughs> it's a special day, as I said. And so I will ask the two of you this. Do you believe in Jesus Christ and put your full trust in his love and grace for your salvation? Do you ask God's forgiveness for your sins and promise to serve Jesus as your Lord and follow the Holy Spirit's guidance in living a truly Christian life that is pleasing to God? Will you continue to surround yourself with brothers and sisters in Christ's church, learning from them and together with them growing in love for both God and neighbor? Friends, as uh, they come forward to share their faith, express their faith and before God and before all of us, it is also our moment to reaffirm our faith and to embrace Brad and Diane into the love of Christ's body, the church. And so I ask all of you, do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ and put your full trust in his love and grace for your salvation. 
Do you continue to promise to serve Jesus as your Lord and continue to grow in following the Holy Spirit's guidance in living a truly Christian life that is pleasing to God? Will you continue to nurture each other in the Christian faith and life and include Brad and Diane in your love and care? Do you promise to continue to grow in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? All right. I want to pray over the water. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for all of the gifts that you give us, including this gift of this day today. In the moment of creation, you hovered over the waters. In the moment of deliverance, you carried Noah and his family through the waters. In the moment of salvation, you delivered Moses and the Israelites through the water. And in the fullness of time, you gave yourself to be born in the waters of birth, to be baptized in the River Jordan, to be the water, living water amongst us all. And so we ask your Holy Spirit, Lord, to please bless this time together in using this gift, that water that you give us as a sign of your presence among us here today. We ask you to bless and anoint Brad and Diane in this holy moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Diane, I'd like to invite you to just kneel on the first step there. Diane, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I just pray that you would pour out your spirit upon this good woman as she comes forward in the fullness of time, Lord, in this time and place to receive you as her Lord and Savior. Lord, they are, this is a special woman. We pray, Lord, that you would anoint her to be everything that you seek for her to be in her marriage, in her family life, in her public life, in her witness for you. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Brad. Brad, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Precious Lord, I lift Brad up to you today as he comes forward in this given moment to receive you as Lord and Savior, Lord. And we just pray that as your prevenient grace has brought both he and Diane to this moment, that your justifying grace, Lord, would bring him to new life and that your sanctifying grace would work on each one of their hearts through your body, the church, that Brad would be the man that you call on him to be in his marriage, in his family, in his public life, and his witness for you. We thank you for this blessed moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you to uh, receive... Your new brother and sister in Christ, Brad and Diane Myers. Blessings to you, baby. Blessings to you, friend. I got something for you here. Glory to God. Let's see, you must be Diane. <laughs> Welcome them into the family again, beloved. I want to remind everybody 
as uh, they have declared their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we as a church, and I mean y'all as a church, have made the promise that you would nurture them in the faith as you nurture each other, and that all together you would love each other and help each other to grow as Christians. It's not a pastor's sole responsibility, though we have a role to play. It is everybody's role to play, to help everybody to grow in Christian faith. Friends, I want to invite you to please stand as you are able and lift up your voices in this wonderful hymn. Amen. Please be seated, beloved. Friends, I want to invite us on a special day just to take a moment. You know, it's uh, been at times a challenging season, and I acknowledge that. It has been for all of us. Um, But you know, throughout all challenges in life, there's one constant. The Lord who will never leave us nor forsake us is always there. And so as we take this moment to breathe out whatever it is we brought in with us, breathe in the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit, I invite us to a time of prayer. And if any want to come forward and have me pray with them, I'd be honored to do so. I come back to you if you just raise your hand. We have anointing oil to be available as well. Let's take a moment just resting in God's grace.
The Lord of heaven and earth, what a blessing it is to be able to gather together uh, in your presence. Uh, Lord, we know that there is no place that we can go when we're not in your presence, but to gather together as your family together is a very special, special, special occasion. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to pour out your spirit on each one of us here gathered and for those who are gathering with us online and for those who are gathering with us in spirit wherever they might be today. Lord, we confess to you that sometimes um, human relationships can be very challenging. We know that's born out of out of sin, Lord. Um, you created a perfect world, and uh, as part of your perfect creation, uh, you created our forebears, but in that you also gave free will. And there are certainly manifest moments when they and we and I rebel against you. We ask your forgiveness today, Lord, as we confess our sin to you and we also know that you are faithful and just and that you will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness but in the process of doing that Lord you pour out your sanctifying grace so that little by little we can resemble you a little bit more each day we pray Lord that that happens in each one of our lives and so, Lord, we thank you for this day. We lift up those around us who are sick. Uh, we lift up those around us who are victims of injustice and poverty. And we pray, Lord, that your body, the church, would continue to grow as a witness in this world to be able to do something about that. We know that injustice and war happens and that it will continue to happen until you rule and reign. And so we pray, first of all, that you rule and reign in our own hearts. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite our choir to share a blessing with us this morning.
Glory to God. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Mary Ann. Thank you, Rosemary, for your direction. Uh, while the choir is uh, being seated again, I wanted to do a little bit of teaching again. Uh, for those who weren't with us the last Sunday that we shared communion together, we have gone back to uh, uh, the uh, sharing the common loaf and cup. Uh, we will have two stations uh, set up where I am here and the corresponding one uh, I'll head over there. Rusty and Kim will be serving over there. We will not be serving in the center. So what I would like to remind you of how it is we want you to do it is to come this way to come forward and then around the outside to go back to your pew. Now, when you come to the center to, to come forward for communion, please try to merge into a single line so that we're not side by side and we're reaching across each other for, you know, the, uh, for the cup and for the loaf and all of that. So if you could merge into a single line and then uh, we'll go around on the outside to return to your pew. I think that would work out best. And if you would still prefer the uh, single serving, we will have them available at, uh, at, both, uh, at both stations as well. Always look forward to sharing the sacrament with you. And hey, we got both of the sacraments today. How about that, huh? It's a great day, a great day. Okay, friends, I want to invite you to uh, open in your pew Bibles, if you are following along, uh, or your Bibles at home, to uh, a passage in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so open your Bibles today to uh, the Gospel according to Matthew and chapter 7 today. Matthew and chapter 7 today. And we will be beginning at, uh, at verse 1, and this is Jesus speaking, Matthew chapter 7, beginning today at verse 1. Jesus says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, Jesus says. First take the plank out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So ends our reading today, beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you today for the word that you give us because we know, Lord, that you are a loving God and that you challenge us from time to time based on that love that you have and the love that you seek to nurture within each one of us. And so, Lord, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon each one of us here gathered And that you would open up our hearts and our minds and our souls so that we could not only hear your deeper message, but that it would change our lives. Lord, I pray that you give me the words to share. And that if these words come only from me, that they have no effect, but that if they come from you, that they will change my heart as well as those who will listen to them. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. How many of you uh, grabbed a bulletin or have handed a bulletin today? Just show, raise your hand if you have a bulletin. I got to tell you, I love that picture on the front. I mean, I... Yeah. <laughs> 
So I, had to, I really had to search for it this time because at one time or another, I've had this picture on the front of the bulletin of every church I've ever pastored. <laughs> I, I want to put that in my photo album, to be honest with you. Love that one. I was recently on social media, and uh, I saw something there on social media. It's actually, a few of you have pointed this out to me as well, that you saw it too. And uh, it, 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 various variations of it, but it basically comes down to this, that um, a lot of folks in churches prefer to be, instead of Christ's witnesses, they like to be God's attorneys. They get to prosecute those that uh, are of a different belief and uh, stand in judgment of others. And uh, it is a challenge, isn't it? Because I, uh, I, I, I take that social media posting and, uh, and uh, the picture on the front of the bulletin and there have been moments in my, in my uh, life where I would say, yeah, I resemble those remarks. You know? Human relationships are tough. Can I get a witness on that? Yeah, yeah, they are. They can be really, really, really tough because we are, even within the church, a collection of sinners who are works in progress by the Holy Spirit of God. And so a passage like today's passage of Scripture can be, they can be really challenging to us because, friends, at moments in our life, they can, those words can really convict us. Now, I believe it's one of the passages of Scripture that uh, are, are, can be quite misunderstood at times. But I would ask this question just to, to uh, start out this thought. To what degree are you willing to have somebody else stand in judgment of you? To what degree are you willing to allow that to happen? Because what Jesus is saying is that is going to happen to the degree that any one of us are going to stand in judgment against somebody else. And so it's really kind of a ball is in our court when it comes to that question. What are we willing, uh, how much are we willing to allow somebody else to stand in judgment. Now, I want to make sure that we understand the context, really, of this passage. First of all, who was Jesus speaking to? He was speaking to disciples. Okay? He was speaking to disciples within the context of everything that he has said so far, and frankly, everything he would say after, and especially within the context of of the Sermon on the Mount that began, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be children of God. So, this is within that context. Um, it's within the context of everything else that Jesus ever did. Now, important truth. To judge does not mean... Uh, in this context, what Jesus is saying is that it's not to decide. What he is saying, we are not to condemn others because condemnation is not our privilege. We are, however, called as Christian disciples to discernment, to use judgment in the course of our life, in the growth of 
ourselves and our, our contribution to the Holy Spirit's work by sanctifying grace and as a part of our witness in the world around us. So, the question becomes, is a Christian ever to stand in a certain degree of judgment? And the answer is yes and no. Yes and no. Understanding again, it's never our role to condemn. It never is. Yes, we are to stand in a degree of judgment or discernment in regards to the world's ways. If Paul wrote in Ephesians, this is an important reminder that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We're in, to put it in shorter, easier to understand terms, by virtue of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, we are to be able to understand a difference between that which is godly and that which is not godly. Okay? We bring that judgment to our witness in human life. It's important that we do that, matter of fact. It is vitally important that we do that. Otherwise, how is the world and those around us, how are they going to know God's ways if God's people don't show them, don't tell them, don't live them, speaking truth in L-O-V-E, love. Speaking truth in love. Now, it is a vastly, I cannot overemphasize this point. When it comes to bringing discernment or Christian judgment into our public witness, we must, friends, we must be grounded in God's ways ourselves. We cannot go off half-cocked on stuff. We must be grounded in God's ways ourselves. Put another way, we must be discipled. The original apostles, they didn't know nothing after a week with Jesus. Oh, maybe they knew that much. After three years, they might have known that much. Pouring out the Holy Spirit, they started to grow and grow and grow to share and witness to what God's ways are. It is vitally important, friends, that we are grounded in God's ways. We are discipled. Using that as a verb and how it is that we're supposed to live as disciples, noun, of Jesus Christ. Because if we're not grounded, chances are very good that the judgment we will be bringing will be our own opinions or our political viewpoints. And oh, by the way, those two things are rampant in the world, in this country and in the world. I would go so far as to say politics is our national religion. And it is so not informed by God's ways that, uh, well, you see the results. You see the results. Our witness, by the way, our witness is enhanced by what we are for. Not what we are against. Because if our witness is only about what we are against, then there's our picture right there. You know? Stand in, ju in judgment. Sinners in the hands of an angry God for those who like history. That's not the way that I understand Jesus to be. 
So yeah, we do in fact bring judgment, godly judgment and discernment to know right from wrong and to model it to a world desperately in need of it. So yes, we stand in judgment there. Along with that comes this question, this result. Number two, no, we do not stand in judgment of those who are outside the church. Those who don't know Jesus Christ, those who haven't been converted to Christ, haven't been reborn in the Spirit, because it's ridiculous to expect Christian living, Christian behavior, out of people who are, by definition, not Christians. Yes, God can, by convenient grace, touch the hearts and souls of a lot of people that do good things. You go into uh, 1 Corinthians, I, I didn't have write the passage down, where Paul says distinctly, it is not our business to stand in judgment of those who are outside the church. Our mission, our privilege is to what? Love them into the kingdom. Train them up in the way they should go. Send them out to love others into the kingdom of God. Those who are outside the kingdom need one thing from us, and that is to be loved into the kingdom of God with an authentic faith that's grounded in Jesus and nothing else. Third thing about who it is that we're supposed to stand in a certain degree of judgment on, would it surprise you to know that we are, in fact, supposed to bring a certain degree of judgment to each other as Christians. We are to be accountable to each other. This loving accountability that I've spoken of numerous times it says here in Galatians chapter 6, Paul writes this to Christians. He says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, regardless of what it is, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. No, we're not called to be watchdogs, but we are called to be loving brothers and sisters. And as Brad and Diane join the family today, it is a sacred privilege to help them and to help each other to grow in God's ways as we ask them to help us to grow in God's ways. Because here's the thing, friends, every single one of us needs Jesus. Every single one of us needs the Holy Spirit to help us to be like Jesus. And every single one of us ain't there yet. And that includes me. And I can get a witness to that. I'm not there yet. I screw up sometimes. And from my vantage point as your pastor, <laughs> so do you. <laughs> but that's why God brings this family around us to help us to love each other. So we're called to live in an accountability, an accountable relationship. Loving accountability is one of the foundational principles, not only of Christianity, but certainly of the Methodist movement as folks gathered in class meetings and band meetings and they gathered together to say, how is it with your soul? And oh, by the way, what sin are you in? Can I, how can I help you? They got serious about it. Maybe we need to get serious about it too. You know? And so, we're called together because our faith is to be lived in loving community. 
Not in isolation. Not in isolation. And it's part of that, the vastly important part, don't practice selective righteousness. You know that, what that is, selective righteousness? What's the absolute worst sin that's ever committed? It's the sin you commit, not the one I commit. Because compared to you, I'm, I'm three steps closer to heaven. Don't practice selective righteousness. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because as we, again, stand with some judgment against somebody, what we're saying is that we're allowing you to judge us as well. So be sure of the plank in your own eye as we engage relationships with each other. Now, again, Jesus is speaking to disciples here. As we're speaking as disciples here, in every every community, every group, there are some people that are just plain prickly. That no matter what you do, no matter how loving you try to be, no matter how um, um, much loving accountability that you want to practice with them, they just rebel against it. You know, you call them, you know, tough. You can call them prickly. You can call them hard-hearted. You can call them bullies. Whatever it is you want to call them. I remind us of this. God calls them beloved. That even the biggest bully that any one of us can even conceive is somebody who has been created in the very image of God and for whom Christ also went to the church. Now, our call with such a person within the body of Christ is the same as with anybody else, to reach out in loving accountability, to walk next to them, to say, I love you, but here's my concern, and to raise it up, have the hard conversations in humility, in repentance of your own, in grace, and in love. But at some point, at some point, if all of that is rejected, and that prickly one is still prickly, Scripture does teach several passages that are fairly consistent. Matthew chapter 18, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus speaks directly to this. I chose a passage out of um, Paul's letter to Titus in chapter 3 today that I wanted to share with you if you encounter that prickly person that you, nothing you can do to change them. Paul writes this, beginning at verse 1, a couple of verses. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. To slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. But then a few verses later, when it comes to that one or the, those ones that are just prickly as all get out, Paul writes this, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once. And then warn them a second time. And after that, have nothing to do with them. Warn a divisive person once. And then warn them a second time. And after that, have nothing to do with them. It may sound harsh. 
that I would make the case that it may just be the most loving thing that you could do because to continue the argument, to continue beating heads against walls, that would be the harsh thing to do. And so as you go forward in loving people and and sharing loving accountability, and if you ever run into that especially prickly one that You warn them once, you warn them twice, and then, friends, you walk away. You just walk away. And as others walk away as well, that allows room for the temperature to cool down. And perhaps that's the way that the Holy Spirit of God will engage that person's heart or those person's hearts and convict them into what's right. Now, we'd say this with one big caveat here. Make sure your own judgment is right too because you're the one that might be wrong. But if there is no other recourse, you back away. And you walk away. And as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And in due time, the Holy Spirit of God may change hearts. As people walk away, a person's isolated. Their influence, their authority drops. And the Spirit does something in their heart. Pray for them always. Pray for them always. As remember this story from the gospel about a prodigal son, prickly son of a gun that he was. He was in the moment of isolation when the guy was eating pig slop and all of a sudden God changed his heart. Maybe that's the most loving thing to do in that particular area, but whatever you do, don't become a bully yourself. What would happen? I'll wrap it up here. What would happen today if the soul of a church reflected humility, grace, repentance and forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation and love? instead of the soul of a church reflecting this guy. To God be the glory. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the word that you give us. Lord, you are the eternal judge and you give us your grace that allows us to be able to discern right from wrong, anger from love, division from reconciliation. We confess to you, Lord, for those moments where we maybe stood and said, it's my way or the highway, instead of saying, thy will be done. But as your Holy Spirit continues to work in our hearts, 
we pray for those in our lives. Wherever they may be, that hearts would change and that we would live in grace, reflecting your love always. Relationships can be very hard at times, Lord, but with you, all things are possible. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I invite our ushers to uh, present our morning offering. I invite you all to please stand as you're able. Gracious Lord, thank you so much for all the ways that you provide for us. And Lord, now as we return to you a part of this provision, Lord, we pray that your spirit would continue to work in our hearts so that we would grow as provision for those around us, beginning with our brothers and sisters in Christ and through each one of us to a world who desperately needs you. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We are so blessed to be able to gather together today at Christ's table. And it is his table. And all who seek him are welcome at his table. We remember when he gathered with his loved ones at the table for the last time. And he took bread. And he gave you thanks and praise. And he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body and it will be given up for you. When you do this, do this in memory of me. And then he took the cup and again, he gave you thanks and praise. And he gave the cup to his disciples and he said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all so that sins would be forgiven. When you do this, do this in memory of me. Lord, we thank you so much for these gifts of bread and wine. We ask, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon them and upon all of us here gathered, that they would become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that we, Lord, your body washed in your blood would continue to grow in love, in joy, in mission and ministry with the world around us. We thank you, Lord for the grace that you pour upon each one of us. And as we gather together today, we raise up in one voice the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to invite uh, Rusty and Kim and Mitch to come on forward. said, friends, you don't need to be a member of this church or any church. Everyone who seeks Jesus is welcome at his table.
friends, I don't know if you remember this, but um, those who were here, <coughs> excuse me, those who were here last week, I shared with you the, about the work of the Holy Spirit of God, and that the goal wasn't excellence in church management, but rather perfect love. And so with that in mind, I invite you to please stand as you are able and join me in our closing hymn here today. Well, beloved, as we uh, are, uh, go out to the narthex, please take some time to welcome uh, Brad and Diane into the church family. I know that you've been doing a great job of that already anyway. Um, I would ask that you keep annual conference in your prayers. A reminder, next week uh, the UWF will be uh, leading with Rusty on uh, Undy Sunday. And then uh, two weeks from today, I invite you all uh, to come and gather on a, on a very special day for me and I hope for all of us. So, May the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of us to be shared with the world around us and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Amen.